So um, today I'm excited because we've been in a series called Crazy Faith. <laughs> Has anybody been blessed by this series? Oh, come on. Have you been blessed by this series? If you're watching online and you've been blessed, make some noise. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So I told y'all we crazy till Christmas, right? Okay, cool. And we told you last week that, that faith without works is what? And, and, and so we got to figure out how faith works. Faith works by love. And, and love works by us giving. And we told you on December 15th, we're going to be giving this crazy faith offering. And I'm so excited because there are people that have already started saying like, yup, I'm not buying that. I'm going to give this to God. People that have canceled vacations, people who have gotten with their husbands and wives and said, this is what I believe we're going to do in faith. Everybody say in faith. In faith. Say it like you mean it. In faith. in faith. Those watching online, everything. I don't want anybody to leave without that card that says I'm, I'm believing God in crazy faith for. And I want you to fill that out. I want you to put that on your car, put that, put that on your refrigerator, put that somewhere so we can be in faith. Cause I believe God's about to do some crazy things for us. Amen. And we're going to bring that in faith on the 15th. But I decided, I was like, you know what? Anytime I read about faith in the Bible, it was never just one person's faith. Faith had friends. And like when I was believing God for like, like this building, there were certain people that I called. Now, let me give a caveat. I didn't call everybody because everybody in your life don't have faith for where God's taking you. Oh, I, could, I know I can get a better amen than that. Everybody doesn't have faith. You know, when you try to tell somebody your idea and they automatically tell why it can't happen. Get away from me. But there's some people you can call that when you talk about the big thing, they say, is that it? And I'm just encouraging you need at least two is that it friends that when you say yo this is crazy but I think God told me that the Spirit Bank Event Center is supposed to be our church and they walk through and they like yeah but there's more I have a friend like that who's gonna bring the word today and uh, many of you may have never heard of him but I promise he's one of the pro most prolific and sought-after preachers in the world right now he has every degree in the world like you know when I be talking about the the people who have more degrees than a thermometer <laughs> that's him <laughs> Harvard and Princeton and uh, great but more than that he has a heart of gold and today I told him that this was his church and that these were his people and, and that he has a word straight from God that he's gonna bless us with when when I was walking through this building before we got it I brought him over here because he was speaking at a conference in the city and we stayed up till 4 a.m. And, and, and we stayed up and we walked through this building when it wasn't ours. And he dreamed with me sitting right there and dreamed with me sitting back over here and walked down the stairs with me and, 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 and told me that God can do this. And he said, Mike, this is going to be a place where people come to get a faith impartation and they're going to leave and go back. And this is before anything had happened. Because faith has to have friends. He encouraged me in a way sitting in my car at 4 a.m. Telling me that God had to do this. Because the body of Christ and the world needed to see a modern day miracle. So he's already a friend of mine. He is a friend of this house. And he has a word from God. You're already standing on your feet. Will you give the loudest ovation that you have for our friend, Pastor Darius. Dang, oh, y'all can do better than... <laughs> so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Darius Daniels Transformation Church. Listen, one of my favorite scriptures is in a Hebrew hymn book called Psalms. And the writer says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Let me give you the Daniel's version of that. We should be able to tell how great your God is by how great your praise is. If he's an okay God, give him an okay praise. If he's a good God, give him a good praise. But if he's an incredible God, give him incredible Praise. 
So Father, to, today I thank you. Thank you for the privilege of laying our eyes on this. Thank you for an expression of your goodness, your greatness, and your genius. Thank you for transformation. Thank you that it's more than a name, it's an assignment. It's a mandate. It's a description of what you're doing. Thank you that this thing that is rooted in Tulsa has sprouted all over the world. Thank you for the leadership that you've given as a gift to it. So we pray blessings on this house, these people, these incredible leaders, and blessings on this service. Anoint me for this assignment. I thank you for the gift of your scriptures. They're the blueprint to our best life. And I thank you for the promise of your presence, the Holy Spirit that gives us help beyond our own. So I pray today for truth and fire. And I ask this in the incredible name of the one who saved our life. That name is Jesus. If you love him, say amen. If you got any praise left to a great God, give it to him right now. Before you take your seats, tell somebody, this is crazy. Well, my name is Darius Daniels. I'm excited to be here with you today. Honored to witness what God is doing here. I've had the, the privilege of being in a lot of places and spaces. I've never seen anything like this. And um, I'm not referring to the, the size of the auditorium or the amount of people that are present. I'm talking about the thing that I sense. A room full of faith. A room that is an expression of the kingdom. And the kingdom is not this or that. It's this and that. I see mama them, grandmama them. I see Sheila and Shanae all in the same church. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. And uh, I was doing some reflecting this morning. And uh, Mike, you might get a trip out of this. In my phone, there was a name, and I had misspelled it. It was the first time I met Pastor. It was years ago at a conference in Dallas. He wasn't even pastor in then. And uh, I didn't know how gifted and creative he was. I just knew his personality was infectious. And his heart was gold. And I had put his name in the, <laughs> put his name in the phone wrong, wrong because we had a brief, brief exchange with each other and one of the things that, that I saw then is one of the things that I feel like God has used in a major way to create such an amazing space like this. To me, he's kind of like a David in the Bible. David who was creative, wasn't he? Incredibly creative. He was a musician, a, a great leader. But the thing that God chose above everything else to use to promote him was his heart. Said, I found a man after my own heart. I think that's the greatest and the highest compliment I've ever seen God give anybody in Scripture. And it is definitely my sentiments toward your incredible pastor, my brother, my friend. You've got, this is an expression of God's love for you that he wedded you two together. 
God must love you, that he gave you him, and he must love him, that he gave him to you. So I want you to make some major noise for your incredible pastor, my brother. Pastors Mike and Natalie. Love you. All right, y'all ready to go to work? You talk back to the preacher here or no? Okay. Daniel chapter number three, verse 16. Daniel chapter three, verse 16. I want to read a couple of verses there. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version, so click there. Or we got some clickers in this room, some turners in the room. I hear pages turning. I'm like, wow, Bible paper Bibles in the room, so the scripture's on the screen. Listen to this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you set up. The clause of concern is found in verse 17. I want to read it one more time. If we are thrown into the blazing blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. I want to talk uh, from this topic in our time together today. This is part whatever of crazy faith. I want to talk from this subject, blazy faith. Blazy faith. As we ease into this introduction, I want to inform some and remind others that your presence on this planet has purpose. You are not the consequence of some cosmic coincidence. You are not the result of some relational accident. Your parents may have been surprised by your arrival, but God was not. You have been strategically and intentionally placed on this planet for such a time as this. The God who made and molded you intentionally intended on you being born when you were born, where you were born, how you were born, and with what you were born with. You are not operating with any kind of deficit because latent on the inside of you is absolutely everything you need to be exactly who God called you to be and to do exactly what God called you to do. And the reason I can communicate this with confidence is because I eavesdropped on a conversation between God and a gentleman named Jeremiah. And God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, before I form you, in the womb. Notice what he says now, before I form you, your parents made you, but I formed you. Meaning you've been built by design. You've been crafted for your calling. You've been wired for your work. I made you with purpose in mind. So if I called you to it, I equipped you for it. I knew what I was putting in you before you discovered it was there. And just because people can't see it don't mean it's not present. He says, before, before I formed you, I knew you. I knew all about you. I knew you before you knew yourself. I knew you would be moody on Mondays. I knew it. I knew you would be cranky without coffee. I knew it. I knew your mistakes before you made them. And I knew your missteps before you took them. Yet I still picked you. So whenever you begin to communicate to the one who called you how unqualified you are, his response to you is, you think I didn't know that? 
I knew that before you did that. But I don't choose you because of, I choose you in spite of. Therefore, when anybody has an attitude about what I'm doing in your life, tell them, don't talk to me because I didn't pick myself. Talk to my supervisor. The one who called me is faithful. He laid his hands on me. He anointed me. You surprised I'm here. I'm surprised I'm here too. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, Your presence on the planet has purpose, and purpose is always an answer to a problem. The creation of the light bulb solves a darkness problem. The creation of vehicles solves transportation problems. The, the, the creation of medicine solves sickness problems. And your creation, your purpose is an answer to a problem and the reason the enemy doesn't want you and me to discover it, submit to it and walk in it is because he knows when purpose is unfulfilled we leave the next generation with some Goliaths we were supposed to slay you've got purpose I said you've got purpose but I want to pause for this cause because it would be irresponsible for me to tell you that, and not on the flip side, tell you this. It will be ministry malpractice <laughs> for me to tell you that, and then not tell you this. Do you want to know? Yeah. I ain't feeling that side over there. I said, do you want to know? Yeah. Uh, here it is, here it is. Purpose. It's God's preference for us. It's what he prefers to do. It's what he wants to do. It's what he's willing to do. It's what he's willing to part Red Seas to make happen. He'll knock down Jericho walls to make it happen. He will make ravens feed a prophet to make it happen. Now, people feed birds. Birds don't feed people. But when God's determined to do something in your life, he'll make something act inconsistent with his nature to get it to you. It's his preference. But in order for God's preference to become our experience, it requires our participation. I'm going to say it again. In order for God's preference to become our experience, it requires our participation. It's not enough for God to want it for me. I have to want it for myself. Come on. Isn't this one of the questions that Jesus even asked one man before he healed him? He asked him, do you want to be made well? And I believe I'm in a space today, not just with some holy people and some happy people. I believe I'm in some space with some hungry people. Some people came to transformation not to play church, but you came because I'm hungry, because I feel something on the inside of me. I got a spiritual insatiable appetite. I'm allergic to average. I start breaking out when people around me don't want the next level. I'm hungry for everything God wants to do. It. Let me hear the hungry people make some noise. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. That's why I take a lick and it keep on ticking. Because I'm hungry. That's why when I wanted to give up, I can't give up. I'm hungry. Is there anybody here that's made up their mind that I will not back up, let up, give up, or give in until I step into everything that God has for my life? And could this be one of the things the psalmist meant when he said God gives us the desires of our heart? Could, could one way of looking at that mean he gives my heart desires? 
so that some of the things he wants, he makes me want it. <laughs> because he knows it's not enough for him to want it for me. I got to want it for myself. So the more he puts his hands on my heart, my heart starts wanting for me what he wants for me. So maybe, Hannah, you want a baby not because you need some company. Maybe God wants a prophet. <laughs> what if I told you some stuff you want is what God needs in the earth? And that's why you can't shake it. That's why you try to give up on it and God won't let you because he says this isn't just something you want. This is something I need. And I'm going to agitate your heart until you step into the fullness of what I put in you. Purpose requires our participation. And there's a word that describes what that participation looks like. You've been talking about it for several months. That word is faith. What if I told you, this is for my note takers, what if I told you, this is a harsh reality, but it's biblical. What if I told you, God will let you live on whatever level you settle for. That's Bible. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth and he's in the synagogue. He opens the scroll, the scripture. He begins to teach and people are listening to him teach. And, and while he's teaching, some people say, yeah, I knew him. He grew up here in Nazareth. Isn't this the carpenter's son? And the Bible says Jesus could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Faith is the bridge that you must cross to get from where you are to where you could be. F faith is the bridge we must, the road we must take to get from a life, a life that's purposeless to a life that's purposeful. Faith is the transportation system that gets us from the wilderness to Canaan land. Faith. But this kind of faith I'm talking about isn't just any kind of faith. See, any kind of faith won't get you there. Hasty faith won't get you there. Lazy faith won't get you there. Fugazi faith won't get you there. Yeah, if you're going to get there, you need some crazy faith. You need some wavy faith. And you need some blazy faith. <laughs> Somebody say blazy faith. Come on, say it again. Say blazy faith. Yeah, see, see, what, what, what is blazy faith? I, I can show you more than I can tell you. I can show you more than I can tell you. In Daniel chapter number Three, we see this interesting example of blazy faith. Here contextually, this, this, is, this is really interesting, what happens at the first part of Daniel. It's, it's God's people have gone through a season of significant loss. They've been conquered by a country called Babylon. And this is what's weird about Babylon. When Babylon conquers a country, their practice was to strip the country they conquered of their culture. It's a powerful picture of the enemy who Jesus describes as one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Those aren't three different ways of saying the same thing. Those are three different things that the enemy does. He steals, kills, and destroys. We, we got to get this because if we, Paul says if we are ignorant of Satan's devices, he gets an advantage over us. He doesn't just want to destroy and kill, he wants to steal. And sometimes we survive seasons 
and we're celebrating our survival. God brought me through. God brought me out. God brought me over. And sometimes the enemy is observing our activity and saying, I didn't send that to kill you. I sent that to steal. You survived, but your optimism didn't. You survived, but your hope didn't. You survived, but your dreams didn't. The enemy doesn't just want to kill, he wants to steal. And that's what made him so agitated with Job because he kept taking stuff, but he couldn't take what he really wanted. And that's why he's so mad at some of you. Because no matter what he takes, he can't take the thing he really wants. He wants your commitment to God. And some of you have made a decision. Whether I go in the furnace or outside the furnace, I'm rocking with God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Here it is, let's give the devil a nervous breakdown right here. Everybody that's going through something, praise God anyway. Because you want my praise, but I won't let you have it. <laughs> you're mad, ain't you, devil? Because you're coming after my health, but you want my praise. And you're coming after my family, but you want my praise. And you're coming after my job, but you want my praise. But I won't let you have it. So they would conquer a country and they would strip them of everything. They would, strip, they would strip you of your name. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not Hebrew names. They're Babylonian names. Because that's what the devil does. In the middle of a season, a loss, he wants to label you. Did you hear what I just said? He wants to label you in a season of loss so that when you're going through loss, you come out of the loss, you survive, but you lose your identity. And you come out with identity crisis. Right? Because watch this. People can only use people who don't know who they are. Did you hear what I just said? People who date down. Is that... Can I say that in Oklahoma? I can say that in New Jersey. You know, people who date down. Lowering standards. People who, who have gotten labeled through a loss. Not good enough. Not smart enough. Not strong enough. Not pretty enough. They labeled them through loss. They tried to take everything, including, listen to this, their faith, their religion, their faith. It's in the text. They build this huge idolatrous statue and say, everybody has to bow down to this statue. And these three Hebrew boys who are working for the Babylonian kingdom are faced with the threat of abandoning their faith, listen to this, or suffering the punishment of being thrown into a furnace blazing with fire. They refuse to do so and they're called before Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king. And Nebuchadnezzar says, now I'm going to give you one more opportunity. 
And we read their response at the beginning of our time together. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, now listen, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. <laughs> I'm not even going to bother that. We're so convinced that we don't have to convince you to make us feel better about what we convinced about. I don't need you to believe it for me to believe it. They say, in other words, I'm being nice. No need to defend ourselves in this matter. Listen to this. They said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Please don't miss this. Because upon first reading, this reads like a contradiction. They say God is able and he will. But when you read the story, I want you to see what happens. When you read the story, they didn't say, oh, this is about to make you uncomfortable. They didn't say he will deliver us from the fire. Read the text. It says he will deliver us from your hand. Did you hear what I said? But verse 18, here is the blazy faith. But even if he does not, see that's another level of faith right there. See, see in verse, in verse in verse 17, they're saying God is willing and God is able. But then in verse 18, they say, but even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down. See, <laughs> this is blazy faith because blazy faith is faith that is stubborn, unyielding, unbending, and fireproof. Blazy faith is fireproof faith. Pastor Darius, why do you say that? Because as soon as the Hebrew boys make this amazing statement, they get thrown in the fire. <laughs> Bro, li listen. Now I'm thinking, you make a stand like that, God got to come through for me right now. Y'all feel me? That makes sense? Uh, God, I'm standing for you. For God, I live. For God, I die. Well, you getting ready to die. Hold on, Jesus. Wait. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. They go in the fire. Which, are y'all ready for this family? And, and I think, I think, I think we, we need to pause for this because fire represents a number of different things in scripture. But one of the things it represents is it represents challenges. Peter says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you as though something strange is happening to you. Peter says, Peter says, don't think this is strange. He's teaching us something about the gospel. The gospel is not, a gos not just the gospel of avoidance. Yes, there are some things we avoid. The Passover story is about avoidance. The Red Sea is about avoidance. Jericho walls are about avoidance. Yes, but the gospel is not just the gospel of, uh, of avoidance. The gospel is also a gospel of overcoming. Yeah. That there are some things I don't avoid, but I can't overcome. So even if I'm not delivered from the fire, I'm delivered from your majesty's hands. Did you hear what I just said? Here's my question. Do you have blazy faith? That's faith that survives fire. Whew. It's I know you came out, but did you bring your faith with you? I'm talking about blazy faith. Blazy faith, because the Hebrew boys, come on, let's humanize them for a little bit. They got to be in the fire furnace now, like, Jesus, ain't this something else? <laughs> now, I took a stand for you, so I'm supposed to be avoiding circumstances like this. Come on. Not that they wanted it to happen to anybody, but let's humanize them. They had to be thinking, out of everybody, this could have happened to. 
how could you let this happen to me? Is that, that, that's, is that all right? How could you let this happen to me? I don't want it to happen to anybody, but I didn't expect this to happen to me. Not this, not this, not a breakup, not me, not a divorce, not me, not chemo, not me, not a diagnosis, not me, not a rejection letter, not me, not a denial, not me, not losing these accounts. I need these accounts. They are key and critical, consequential to my business, not losing these accounts, not me. Come on, humanize them for a little bit. Take off the church mask for a minute and look into the eyes of three young men who feel like they losing everything trying to do the right thing. <laughs> not, not, not that they would have wished it up on anybody else, but if God would have asked for recommendations, They'd be like, Jesus, you know, I know a few people that's not even trying to live. I mean, I'm not saying, <laughs> I mean, at least I'm trying. I know a few people that's not even trying and they, they happy. It is fireproof faith because blazy faith is faith that's on fire. <laughs> and you fight fire with fire because fire can't consume fire. So when the fire of trials of life run into blazy faith, they run into a faith that is already on fire. And blazy faith does not allow disappointment from what didn't happen in the past to stop you from believing about what can happen in the future. You want to know what blazy faith is? You sitting in blazy faith. You missed it. You sitting in blazy faith. You sitting in a stubborn faith that wouldn't take no for an answer. You sitting in stubborn faith that when they said they won't sell, a faith that says my God is still able to bring the vision to pass. And the text reveals to us the power. I'm almost done, y'all all right? The text reveals to us the power of blazing faith. L listen to what happens. The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar decides to put these three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, right? And this is what happened. It says that he told the people, turn it up seven times hotter than what it normally is. So the men who are grabbing these young men and putting them in the fiery furnace, listen to this. These men, as they're throwing them in, the heat's so hot. The Hebrew boys stay alive, but these men get burned up. See, this is what Blazy Faith will do for you. Blazy Faith will help you survive what scorches others. It means that you can have the same experiences, but not have the same outcome. And somebody in here needs to pause for the cause of giving God praise, because when you look back over your life, there are some things you survive that scorch others but somehow God got you out and you want me to come to transformation and be quiet, I can't do that. I shouldn't even be here. I shouldn't even be alive. They, they threw them, this is interesting, they throw them in the fire, but the text says they throw them in the fire a certain way. It, it's in the text. It says, they throw these men, this is verse 23, chapter three, firmly tied. So they're bound, firmly tied into the blazing furnace. Y'all see that? But the Bible says in verse 24, the king leaped to his feet in, 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 in amazement and he says, okay, I'm tripping. He said, I'm bugging. He has to ask, he said, now wait a minute. Weren't there three men tied up? Y'all better come get me, I feel this. Tied up, thrown into the fire. They said, certainly your majesty. 
He says, well, look, I see four men. Y'all missing this? Unbound and unharmed and the fourth looks like the son of God. Don't miss this. The fourth looks like the son of God. This is what we call in theological circles a Christophany. It is a premature manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament before the fulfillment of his manifestation in the New Testament. Here's the point. The point is, blazy faith. We talk about the times that God shows up late. A Christophany is when Jesus show up early. Blazy faith will make them show up early. I don't know who this is for today, but if you got faith, God can do it ahead of schedule. You do know you're sitting in blazy faith. You do know there are places and spaces that wait their whole, the whole life and span of their ministry and never experience anything like this. Jesus did it early. Now, I just got a question for you. I just got one question for you. If Jesus did it for your church, and you are part of this church, that must mean Jesus wants to do it for you. I want somebody that believes you next to give God a, I'm next praise. I'm next. I'm done, remain standing. Listen, listen to what happens. The king said, tell them men to come out. Get them out of there. They went in there bound, but the fourth one, Jesus, got in there, and before he delivered them out of the fire, he loosed them in it. Because some people are in the fire, but they're bound with bitterness, bound with anxiety, bound with anger. But what if I told you blazy faith helps you get loose in it before God delivers you out of it? And the same king that threw them in is the same king that said, get them out. Because blazy faith makes your enemies eat their words. The same people that called you crazy, like, you a genius. You hear me? And here's my whole point, and I'm done. I want you to look at what Nebuchadnezzar says when the Hebrew boys come out. First thing he says is, praise be the God. Do you see that? Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So you have this pagan polytheistic king that's saying no other God can save like their God and he issued a decree nobody can speak negative about this God. God was using their story the whole time to turn the heart of this king in the direction of this God. Here it is, because I want to weave this back to purpose. Let's make a hermeneutical loop. Let's come all the way back to the introduction. Listen to this. What if I told you we don't know what the Hebrew boys' skills were? They're not in the Bible because of skill. Because whenever we think of purpose, most of the time, we just think about God using our skill. (laughs) 
You don't even need faith to use skill. You can use your gift in bitterness. You can sing and be bitter. Right? Come on now. You can cook for people you don't even like. Let me just cook this. Purpose is not just about God using skill. Purpose is about God using your story. And he said, when I use your skill, that's pretty. That's pretty. That's glamorous. That's glorious. He says, but when I use your story, there's fire involved. And if we don't teach you how to handle fire, you will mismanage fire seasons. I'm telling you. I'm in the Northeast. It's a very unchurched demographic, and most people resist, many people resist the faith, faith or the people that defect from the faith. Defect because they have not properly been prepared on how to deal with fire when life happens. Their faith gets burned. Like you were such a strong believer. What happened? Fire. And they survived, but their faith didn't. And today, before I pray over you and take my seat, that's my question to you. Is disappointment from what didn't happen, from what did not happen in the past, stopping you from believing what can happen in the future? Has my crazy faith been consumed by disappointment? Today, I want you to know Jesus wants to set your faith on fire again so you can fight fire with fire. A faith that survives the fire. A faith that survives a no. A faith that survives a diagnosis. A faith that survives a healing that did not manifest. A prayer for healing that did not manifest the way you hoped. Blazy. And I'm done. But you can walk with God in two ways. You can have facelifts or heart transplants. Facelift. You can act like it's crazy faith and wavy faith. Or you can have a heart transplant and say, God, I know I can't get crazy faith until I give you this disappointment. I need to be real. God, I trust you, but I'm disappointed. And I need to give you this. Because you only consume the sacrifice I put on the altar. You won't heal what I won't reveal. And as long as I'm hiding the disappointment in my heart, you'll never heal it. I know what I'm talking about. I live this. Not lived, live. Fire after fire after fire. And today, God is saying, you've been carrying something way too long that belonged to me. And we hadn't had a real conversation about it because you think faith means denying reality. Faith is not denial of reality. Faith is believing God to change it. But we need to have a real conversation. And you need to give me this. And some of you in this room, you're in a season that is so critical. You're at a pivot season. You got to turn here. You don't have time to work this out four years through therapy. You need God, the great physician, to go into your heart and say, give me that today. So you can believe again for you. 
Because it's possible to believe what God can do for us and not believe he can do it for me. And today, the heart healer, God, is going to heal the wounds in your heart that are there from disappointment. The wounds you got from having to bury somebody you thought you'd never have to bury. The wounds you got from having to start over in this season of life and you, and you never thought you'd be starting over. The wounds you got from, a, a betra from betrayal and, a, and, and trust broken. From people who, who you loved well but didn't love you back the same way. Disappointment. From results that did not come back the way you wanted them to come back. God's going to heal your heart and impart a resilience in you. So that you move from just strong faith to long faith. Still believe. God can handle your disappointment. Remember we talked about David earlier, a man after God's own heart? Read the Psalms. It's a man who had an unfiltered relationship with the Father. And today, if you have that moment with God, God's going to have that moment with you. The heart healer is here to take your disappointment so that you can really live with crazy faith. Father, I thank you that your word says you heal the brokenhearted and you bind up their wounds. So I pray for broken hearts all over this place, all online. And I pray that you reach into the recesses of our heart, that you pull out disappointment and that you pull out bitterness and everything that is keeping us from believing you the way you've called us to believe. And I pray now for an impartation, according to Romans 1.11, an impartation for blazy faith. Faith that survives fire. Give us the ability to believe again, to hope again. To trust again and as you do so may it be said of us and said of this house as it was said of the early church these are they that have turned the world upside down in Jesus name amen